Du meinst? Da. Noch her? Oh, <lacht> <laughs> he probably thinks I didn't know where the lapel mic was. But after the water, I was just testing him. All right, anyway, yeah, we found the, we found the lapel mic. I come up to put the lapel mic on. Well, it's good to be saved, isn't it? Amen. It really is, really is. Now you see why the Lord has to keep our salvation. Because <laughs> you'd misplace it or, you know, sell it off or spill it or something. But... Um, <laughs> I, uh, I want to mention uh, something before I begin. I was going to say something last night about the book table. I only say anything once, and uh, so I only say, uh, say this once. Please buy everything. <laughs> All right? But um, <clears throat> there are several things back there that are free. I know Baptists like free. And so uh, I'm going to direct, those, uh, direct your attention to those. That is a, um, a book catalog. That tells everything that's available, so that's back there. That's free. And, um, and this is free. And guys, I'm, I'm really serious. Uh, uh, we really want prayer. We really want prayer. This is what keeps us going. Uh, I've often said this, you know, everybody wants something. And as a rule, evangelists want money. And the simple reason is that that's the, that is the smallest negotiable commodity that you can carry with you. Uh, I was in Idaho and a guy in the church was being nice to us and gave us 50 pounds of potatoes. You know what you do when you get 50 pounds of potatoes when you live in a trailer? Get rid of one of the kids. That's what you do. And um, see, we originally had four kids. But uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> then we had three and 50 pounds of potatoes. But um, uh, what you do is you, you, you thank them profusely because that's a very thoughtful thing. And, and then at the next church, you, uh, you take 10 pounds out, give 40 pounds away. But you can't buy gasoline with potatoes. And, uh, and so I said that to say this. Everybody wants something, and most guys want, most evangelists want money. I'm not really after money. What I really like is prayer. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in a church in, in upstate New York not long ago. Oh, no, it wasn't. My goodness, no, it was in Ohio. Yeah. Why did I think Ohio? Oh, there's a guy, there's a guy in New York that does this. But um, I was a church in Ohio, uh, and, a, and a young mother brought her eight-year-old daughter up to me, and she said, this is my daughter. Her name is Sarah, and she prays for you three times a day. Now, guys, you can't put a dollar amount on that. Man, I'll tell you. So, so uh, we covet a place on your refrigerator. I figure if we can get on a Baptist refrigerator, we got like six chances a day of getting prayed for. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then this is back there, and, uh, and this is free. This was put together by a pastor in Michigan. And I'm just going to read you a couple of these things. It's, it's just what prominent people, some of them uh, not even necessarily saved, but uh, prominent people have said about the Bible. But what, I, what has always caught my attention is what the founding fathers had to say. Uh, like this, John Adams. Because you know, if you were brought up in public school like I was, you were lied to five days a week. And one of the lies that I was told was that, that uh, America was founded by deists, not Christians. Well, here's what John Adams said. He said, uh, uh, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible as their own law book and every member should regulate his conduct, uh, conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Oh, what he said is, what if a country just took the Bible and everybody lived by it? Well, what would you have? Well, if you're going to believe Dan Rather, CNN, uh, Newsweek, USA Today, you'd have this uh, bigoted, narrow-minded, homophobic society. Here is what your second president said you'd have. What a utopia. What a paradise this region would be. Uh, here's Thomas Jefferson. Now, now I went, you know, they're always quoting Thomas Jefferson. He said, the Bible makes the best people in the world. And it did. If you want to know who the best people in the world are, go look in a mirror. Best people in this world are Americans. And it's not because of our, you know, our red, white, and blue pride. It is because this nation was founded on this book. This book affected our culture and our society. And it brought forth, listen, there is no nation so willing to let its 18-year-old boys go and die for somebody else's freedom. There is no nation that goes out and finds a way to cure a disease, then gives it to another nation. And that's, that's what Americans do, and it's all because of the Bible. But I want you to think about this. Uh, the Bible makes the best people in the world. If, if George W. Bush got up and made that statement, 
the news media would be screaming for his resignation or he, you need to apologize to the Muslims. Uh, he also said this, uh, the Bible is the source of liberty. Well, that's true, but um, that means then the, the more the Bible is curtailed in our society, the more liberty will be curtailed. I mean, you watch and see, it's going to get to the point where you're probably going to have to, they'll probably force you to fasten your seatbelt when you get in your car. You see if that doesn't happen. <clears throat> John Quincy Adams said this, and think about this. Think if our, think if our uh, uh, president made this statement, <clears throat> and I'm going to read the first half, and I'll let you finish it according to uh, uh, the local news. Uh, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. Well, was what? Was free enterprise and a multicultural society. No. The highest glory of the American Revolution was this that it connected in one dissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Now that's what your sixth president said. And there's a bunch of them in here like that. And those are back there. And so uh, uh, feel free to take those, okay? And if, you, if you're thinking, well, man, I know somebody I'd like to give one to, but I'd like one myself, then take two or three. Doesn't bother me at all. Uh, that pastor very graciously gives those to us. And so uh, we put them back there for you to uh, uh, pass them out and, uh, and get something from them. And then... Um, you'll see a stack of lessons. I mentioned the lessons last night. <clears throat> now, this is just one lesson uh, in, in a year's lessons, a uh, year's curriculum. They're rubber banded together, and that, uh, a year's curriculum is about that thick. There's 12 lessons for a year. Uh, I told you it's compatible with ACE. And um, uh, this one says Series 11. It's, it's basically it's college uh, level, but I'm trying to give this to kids before they go into Bible college, so I'm giving it to them in the 11th and 12th grade. Uh, basically to inoculate your young people so that somebody doesn't steal their faith in the Word of God. And, um, but please don't take these. I've had people take these, and, and uh, not only does it ruin an entire year's curriculum, but my wife usually shoots them. And so, um, <clears throat> now some of you will be upset with me because I've already colored the pictures. But um, What happened is uh, some students go to Bible college, their Bible is attacked, and then uh, you just go on through this, and, and it's got a, key, a score key that goes with it. Um, if you are uh, uh, wondering what <clears throat> the specific lessons are about, there's a trifold uh, pamphlet back there. These are free. And, and it tells you what's in uh, series 11 and what's in series 12. Uh, it doesn't tell you everything that's in the lessons, but a basic, uh, uh, a basic synopsis of them. So... Um, <clears throat> Those are back there free. Everything else, uh, in some way, you have to pay for. Uh, there's a bunch of new things I, I'd forgotten to mention. We got a, a new four tape series on prayer, a new King James series four. Uh, just got a book on how to get a book published. We have DVDs. We just got some DVDs. My guy down in uh, Cincinnati, I didn't even know they were coming. <clears throat> and so um, uh, those are back there in addition to other things. And, and, and guys, look, you don't have to go, buy, go back and buy anything, all right? You, you can go buy and just leave money if you'd like. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's the commercial, and, uh, and we're through with that. Well, I want you to go to John chapter 14, Gospel of John chapter 14. No, I don't have Alzheimer's. I actually have two messages out of the same passage. That's what it is. When you only have seven, if you can locate them all in one or two verses, you don't have to open your Bible as much. <clears throat> And I want you to get John chapter 14 in one hand. I want you to get it Judges, <clears throat> Judges chapter 6. And we looked at this uh, in John chapter 14. We looked at this last night. It said this, uh, <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. Isn't that nice? I mean, I kind of like that. I just kind of like the Lord said, look, if you had something to worry about, I told you to worry about it. I mean, I just, you said, well, it's kind of sharp. Yeah, but coming from God, it's okay. <laughs> right? And he just said, look, man, if it wasn't so, I'd have told you. And so we can trust him. Uh, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, <clears throat> that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, again, we're going to note the four words, I will come again. All right, uh, we, you say, have you got your needle stuck on that? Yeah. Now, all you kids with CDs, you don't even know what that means. But um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can get a laser stuck on anything, but uh, um, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm preoccupied with the Lord's return, guys. I, uh, I told my wife, you know, uh, some mornings I wake up, I feel like I fell off a five-story building. And, and other mornings, the building, as I get older, the building gets taller. And, uh, and I told her, I said, I'm getting all the wrong reasons for the Lord to come back. I, I'm not sure I love his appearing as much as I love my disappearing, all right? But um, <clears throat> I want you to keep those four words in mind. I will come again. Now go to Judges. Judges chapter 6. And in Judges chapter 6, you know, you've got uh, Gideon. He's talking to this angel. And he wants, to, he wants to go do something. He wants to go bring this angel something. And, and he says this, um, verse 17, he said unto him, If thou found grace in thy sight, uh, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. So here's what Gideon said. He said, he said, he said I'm going to go get a present. I want you to wait right here. You, you've been told that before. Somebody said, look, uh, you wait right here. I'm going to go do something. I'll be right back. And look what the angel said. He said, and he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Now let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is, it is so good to be saved. And Lord God, uh, what a tribute to you that people would come to church on a Tuesday night. Uh, God, I hope uh, every single individual that walked through this door, uh, I pray God their, their very act of stepping into this building to be in this service tonight uh, was pleasing to you, that it was worship to you. God, uh, everybody here could have found an excuse to do something else or, or just stay home. Uh, probably there is somebody here who is tempted for one reason or another to stay home. God came to church. And Lord, I pray you're blessed because of that. Now, God, I pray that you will bless your church or edify your church, <clears throat> that your church will ultimately glorify thee. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, back in John chapter 14, <clears throat> the Lord said, I will come again. And then here in, uh, in Judges chapter 6, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stretch the text a little, okay? But, but this, this uh, Gideon says, you wait here. I'm going to go and I'm going to come back. And this, this angel said, I will tarry until thou come again. He was waiting for somebody to come back, right? So he said, okay, I'll, I'll tarry until you get back. And you know, I, I saw that one time and I thought, you know what, that's not a bad prayer. That's not a bad attitude for God's people to have until the Lord gets back, all right? I will tarry until thou come again. Now, the first thing that I want to get across to you, and this is really not my message, <clears throat> but the first thing I want to get across to you is that the Lord is coming, okay? I know, I know that in, in the time you've been saved, His uh, return has been has been dated and guaranteed and written down and preached on and, and you know, you, you bought the new truck or whatever else it was. Uh, I, I know that all of that stuff has happened and, and that is depreciated uh, to the world, uh, the value of the Lord's return. Trust me, He's coming back. He's coming back. I told you last night, <clears throat> I went to Bible college in 1970 and, and I was just sure that the Lord was going to come back before 73, before I got out and uh, He didn't come back. And then I heard a guy was preaching one time that he was coming back in 1976, and he didn't. And then there was a fellow that uh, said he was coming back October 29th, uh, 1979, but he didn't come. Now, here's what I've noticed about all the guys that date the rapture. First off, guys, I, I think that the dumbest thing you can do is date the rapture. If you're wrong, you look like a fool. And if you're right, who cares? <laughs> I mean, it don't even pay to be right. We're not even going to run around the clouds saying, see, see. I, I call this the greatest book that will never be written, how I correctly dated the rapture. <clears throat> and, and here's what you'll find. If you study the guys that date the rapture, they will date the rapture. And when they find out that they're wrong, they never say, I'm wrong. They always say, oops, I mean next year. And so the guy that said it was going to be October 29th, 1979, instead of saying he was wrong, said, oh, I meant 1980. Well, the Lord didn't mean 1980 because he never showed up. And then there were, uh, let's say, I remember a guy said he was coming in 1986. Um, uh, <clears throat> Lord didn't come. Uh, there were 88 good reasons, remember, why he was coming in 1988. But apparently the Lord didn't get the book. And then it seems like someone, I'm trying to think of who it was, uh, boy, it seems like somebody heavily alluded uh, that 1989 was the year, if our calendar's right. But uh, I don't really give a flip about what he said, because um, <clears throat> he didn't come in 1989. Uh, I saw, um, let's say, 19, 1992, uh, it was early 1992, pulled into a Kmart parking lot. 
There was this suburban, and I don't care how many bumper stickers you got in your car, this guy would make you look backslidden. This guy, you couldn't hardly see the color of the, of the Suburban. He had so many signs on it. He had signs, I don't know, stickers. He had signs, plaster all over it. Then he had a great big sandwich board on top of it, and it said, uh, the Lord is coming. Let's see, this was, uh, did I say 90? 92, it's 19, early 1992. He said, the Lord is coming May 14th, 1992. And that's when I realized. Obviously, the Lord does not frequent Kmart. It was early in 1994 uh, that I picked up a USA Today, and I don't know who paid for this ad. I don't know what a quarter page ad in the USA Today must cost, but that's got to be big bucks. And somebody paid for a quarter page ad in the USA Today uh, in like January of 1994, and, and he dated that the Lord was coming back May 14th, 1994. Now I know, now I know the Lord does not read USA Today. And with all of that, <clears throat> you know, some of, uh, some of the brethren have gotten to the point of, uh, you know, where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep, all things reign, remain the same as they were, were from the beginning of creation. Let me tell you something. He's coming back. Okay? He's coming back. And that is, that, look, that is more sure than your death. You know that? I mean, you are dying right now. When we leave this building tonight, every one of us will be closer to a hole in the ground. We will be closer to death than when we walked in this building. Isn't that true? And yet, you still may not die. You may not die. The Lord's return is more sure than that. The Lord's re return is more sure than your vacation. The Lord's, the, the Lord's return is more sure than Clinton's next scandal. <laughs> the Lord's return is more sure than the news media's next lie. I mean, he is coming back. And I want you to keep that in mind. Now, I hope you got last night's message. Don't let the Lord's return be your excuse to do nothing. Okay? I just want you to know that he's coming back. There's a second thing I want you to think about. And I want to ask you a question. Are you saved? Now, I know that I've got a room full of people that, that it's very doubtful. It would be very doubtful that people would go to church on Tuesday night that are not saved. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, we're not talking about bingo down at the Catholic Church. We're talking about going to a King James, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church uh, during a meeting, and you go on Tuesday night, you've got to, I, I would think you've got to be here because you're saved, or maybe somebody invited you that is saved, and maybe you're not. But I still want to talk to the folks that are here representing themselves as saved. Now, I'm not one of those retreaders, all right? I'm not one of those guys that tries to scare saved folks into thinking they're not so they just can, you know, get up here and, uh, and cry and weep and say, guess I, you know, I guess I really didn't get saved or I'm just making sure. Let me tell you a story. This was back in about 1976. I was preaching to church. And, uh, and there was a, <clears throat> I give you an invitation, and it wasn't, it wasn't a retread message, okay? It wasn't one of those messages to spark doubt. Some preachers, I mean, if they can make a saved person doubt their salvation, they think they've done something for God. And, and I've seen guys, brother, where, I mean, if, if you didn't repent enough, if you didn't take step one, step two, step three, exactly the way this guy says it, uh, God won't revoke your salvation, but boy, this guy will yank it in a heartbeat. And, and that's not what I was preaching. I was just preaching a message. <clears throat> the invitation was given, and the most outstanding man in that church came forward to get saved. I mean, he was a deacon. He was a, a, a sparkling personality, just one of those nice guys, you know. And he came forward. Well, he came forward, uh, he didn't come forward, he came forward and knelt, uh, and the preacher talked to him, and when he got done, the preacher came over and he said, uh, brother so-and-so, he said he just got saved. Now, I'll tell you exactly what I thought when I heard that, I thought, no, he didn't. He was already saved. He was saved, you know, he was saved as a kid, or he got saved and something has happened, maybe he got some sin in his life, and he doubted his salvation, and he probably, you know, he, he came up to get assurance but if that's what he thinks, and, he's, and, and, and this guy said, he asked the pastor, he said, Pastor, could I give him a testimony? And the pastor said, sure. And here's the testimony this guy had. He said, um, he said I know you all think that I was saved, but he said, I've got to tell you the truth. Now, the first person in that family that was saved was his wife. And, and if it's a wife that gets saved, you know what she wants? She wants her husband and her kids to get saved. Husband gets saved, wants his wife and children to get saved. Kids get saved, want their parents to get saved. And so his wife got saved. Well, the first thing a wife does when she gets saved is she sicks the preacher on her lost husband. 
And so she arranged for this pastor to come and visit her lost husband. And this guy was no fool. He said, as, as this pastor, was the pastor of that church, he said, as this pastor was talking to me in my living room, I knew that if I don't get saved tonight, this guy is going to hound me to death. He'd, heard, he'd seen it, you know. I mean, they're just like a bloodhound on a trail. So he said, uh, when this preacher said, would you like to get saved? He said, I told him, yes, I would. He said, we knelt at my couch, and while he was leading me in prayer, and I was out loud repeating, Lord, uh, please come into my heart. Please give me the gift of eternal life. I want to be saved. I'm trusting Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. He said, in my heart, I was saying, don't come in my heart, Lord. I don't want to be saved. I'm just getting this off my back. I don't mean this prayer. I mean, that's, that is exactly what went on with that guy. Hey, that guy didn't get saved. He didn't get saved. He said, but when I got done praying, now I knew I was really in trouble. Because I knew if I didn't start going to church, they'd be on to me that I really didn't get saved. Then, I, then he'd be back. So this guy started going to church. He was there every time the doors were open. He started going on visitation. I mean, he showed up in a suit and tie with his Bible under his arm and went out and led people to Christ. This guy was such an outstanding witness for Christ, outstanding Christian man, that when that church was a young church, when they needed a deacon, that was the guy they voted in. You know what he said? He said, I just got tired of the charade tonight. He said, I just got tired of the pretending. He said, no, I wasn't saved and I doubted my salvation and need to get assurance tonight. He said, I've come in this church every time I've walked through those doors, I walked through a lost man and I knew it. Are you saved? I mean, I don't, I don't mean you claim to be saved. I mean, are you saved? You know, some of you, some of you second generation Christians, did you just say a prayer to please your dad or mom? Did you just say something because, because your mom cried for you and your dad uh, witnessed to you and, uh, and, and, you know, you just thought, man, I'll just get them off my back or that's, this is what they expect me to do. I'm asking you tonight, are you saved? Because if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to hell. And yeah, you may fool somebody. You, you, you think you're going to break your parents' heart by telling them that you weren't really saved. It's really going to break their heart when they go to heaven and look around and don't see you. That's really going to shatter them, pal. So I'm asking you tonight, are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I don't care about your dad and mom. I don't care about your husband. I don't care about your wife. I don't care about your children. I don't care about what you've done. I don't care if you've been baptized. I don't care if you're a deacon in the church. I don't care if you're a soul winner. I don't care what you do. Have you been saved? Because Jesus Christ is coming. And if he gets here and you haven't been saved, I'll guarantee you, 99 out of 100 chances are, you're going to hell. And I know what we say, and we say it for effect, and I don't say it for effect. You are not going to bust hell wide open. You know, it's, ah, oh, you're going to bust hell wide open. You're not going to bust hell wide open. If you want to see what's going to happen when you go to hell, go down to a lake sometime and throw in a rock. And where that rock hits the, the, level, the, the uh, surface of that lake, ripples go out from it, and pretty soon the ripples stop, and you can't even, you can't, you can watch, and after a while you can't even spot the place where that rock went in. I'm sorry, you're not, you're not even going to bust hell wide open. It's not even going to make a big deal when you show up. Just one more sinner, one more hell-bound sinner, ending up where they deserve to be for rejecting Jesus Christ. Are you saved? And if you're not saved, this is the place to do it. And I got news for you. Tonight is the night. You know why? Because of my first point, Jesus is coming. Amen. And if you're stupid enough to say, well, you know, like you said, preacher, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he didn't come in uh, 73, and he didn't come in 76, he didn't come in 79, and he didn't come in 92, and he didn't come in 94. Man, you know, he's probably not coming. Yeah, you're right. You probably get splattered by a bus as you pull out of the parking lot tonight. You got two things against you if you're lost tonight. He's coming, and you're dying. Now, I don't know how you stack up the odds, but that's really not too good for you. If you are a husband that prayed a prayer to please your wife, if you are a wife that uh, prayed a prayer to get your husband off your back, if you are a kid that prayed a prayer to please your parents, I'm telling you, you know what you need to do tonight? You need to forget your pride and, and, and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But believe it or not, that's not my message. My message revolves around these words here, I will tarry until thou come again. Let me tell you what I hate to do.
Man, that's a waste of time. You know, there's a bunch of God's people, and all they're doing is this right here. They are sitting in churches. Some of you are sitting here, and you've come in day after day and week after week and month after month and maybe even year after year. You know what you're doing for God? Nothing. You know what I see? I see that we are, when I, when I picture us waiting for the Lord's return, I picture us at a bus stop. We're waiting for a bus. Now, to be very honest, if you've got to wait for a bus, what a place. Is this not the greatest bus stop in the world? I mean, aren't you glad that you're not waiting in New Guinea? Aren't you glad you're not waiting in Iraq? I mean, man, we're waiting for the Lord to come, and, and we're waiting, and right behind us on the corner is a Burger King. It may get better than that, but I have not figured out how yet. I mean, we, we are waiting for the Lord to return, and we are air-conditioned and centrally heated. We got five-on-hour bumpers. We got padded seats. I like this stuff, all right? If you got some romantic attachment to hard oak pews, buy one and sit on it. <laughs> but not me, man. I am a product of my generation. I like padding. I like, I like central air. I like central heat. I like heated baptistries, guys. I know some people get up and say, well, you know, they broke the ice on the pond to baptize me. And I think, with your head. <laughs> Man, I'm, if I got saved in January and they said, well, Sam, we're going to break the ice on the creek there, there to baptize you, I'd say, that's okay. You sprinkle me, I'll be a Methodist till July. <laughs> I am a product of my generation. What I'm going to give you tonight is just some things to do while you tarry until he comes again. You see, I am sure of one thing. I, I, am, I am convinced that the majority of people here are saved. When I say convinced the majority, I can't put my finger on anybody that I would, that I would say that person probably isn't. I'm just guessing there's probably one or two here that for one reason or another have not trusted Christ. I'm, I'm assuming that the majority of people here are saved, Okay? And of you say, folks, the vast majority are not called to preach. There's a bunch of men in this room that God has not called to preach. And all the women he hadn't called to preach. That's right. Now, ladies, listen. This book said you can't preach. Don't get mad at me. I didn't put that in there. Had I written the Bible... I would have put that in there. <coughs> uh, I have to admit, God had a pretty good idea when he came up with that one. That was a good... I mean, I don't know how women preach, you know. What does a woman say? Get right with God or I'll scratch you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they say, you know, what, you know. You know, repent or I'll hit you with my purse. I don't know what they say. <laughs> but whatever it is, I'll bet it's way up there in the octave level. I said, I got it. <clears throat> Your pastor's from Texas, right? Man, you know what it's like to be from Texas and to come up to the frozen wasteland? <laughs> I was talking with Brother Brad Dan, and guys, I, I look at the map. You know, this is the Canadian border, and I look at the map of the United States in the wintertime. You know how they've got all those bands uh, every 10 degrees? And I always see Minneapolis is always right here. And it'd go like this. And I think, I think, boy, you guys really got to be wicked. God is really mad at you, man, because, because, I mean, 10 miles east and 10 miles west, it's 20 degrees warmer. I don't mean in another state. I mean in another county. I mean two streets down. And I look at that, and I think, and I think about you all the time, brother. And, I mean, Texas, guys, Texas. Texas is where you can wake up and drive all day and go to bed in Texas. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it. I've gotten up and driven 700 miles, drive, get, wake up in Texas, drive 700 miles, and go to sleep in Texas. Most of those guys don't leave because they don't know they can get out. <laughs>
Well, you leave your friends, you leave your family, you got something coming. I believe that. But you know, if you're here tonight and you're saying, well, I just want to do something. Guys, you know what I want? I, honest, honest. I would want to do something. If I were you and I was not called to preach, I would want to do something while I tarried until he came again. I would want to find something that I could do while I'm waiting for the bus. I would want to find something that I could do rather than do this for God. And so I'm just going to, all I'm going to do, I'm not, I'm not going to yell at you, I'm going to call you a sinner. I'm just going to give you some ideas. And maybe something I say tonight, you will apply to your life. Maybe we'll get on the other side, you'll have some rewards waiting because you just found something better to do than, than twiddle your thumbs. I'll tell you what you can do. <clears throat> And you don't have to do all these, but you can do any number of them. You could, you could pick neighborhoods, and you've got a big city here, 2 million people. You could pick blocks of the neighborhoods, and you got chick tracks back there, and they have a thing they call Operation Somebody Cares. And I think it's about a six-week or six-month, I, I, I can't remember how this thing works, but um, I think it's six months, and, and once a month, you go through that neighborhood, and you leave, a particular church, uh, chick track there, not just the, the one you choose. They, they've got them chosen which, which six it is. <clears throat> now, now, here's the first thing that happens. Some of you are scared to death to talk to people. You're either afraid to talk to them or you're afraid they're going to ask you a question and you're going to be embarrassed or you're not going to have the answer. And, and, and this is the point where I'm supposed to call you a coward and say you don't love souls. And I'm not going to tell you that. With this program, you don't have to talk to anybody. They tell you, don't talk to them. Put a little rubber band through the binding of the chick track, walk up, put the rubber band over the doorknob, go to the next house. If the guy is mowing his grass, don't bother him. Just walk up, how you doing? Put the chick track on, go to the next house. Go through that entire neighborhood on one particular day of the month. One month later, you go through the exact same neighborhood with the second chick track. You don't talk to anybody, you don't witness to anybody, you're not trying to win them. You just walk up there and... Over the, over the door handle goes another chick track. And you do that for, for six months. And I read one time where they said that by the fourth month, you've got people standing on the porch waiting for their track. <laughs> I mean, they want to get their chick track. And in the sixth month, I think the last track they give is this was your life. And they have hordes of people saved. Now, I talked last night, you know, and some of you believe this. Some of you believe the Lord's coming in the next six months. Okay, get your neighborhood, and for the next six months, work it. Now you say, well, preacher, you know, I'll see you six months from now and say, man, you know, I, I got this neighborhood, and I went through, and I got a bunch of people saved, but the Lord didn't come back. Then pick another neighborhood. <laughs> now, there is a downside to this, and it is the downside that Baptists evade like like HIV. You might have to pay for the tracks. <laughs> yes, I know you love souls, but not that much. And you say, well, you mean I have to buy those tracks and I have to buy them again and then I have to buy them again? Let me, let me not say something else that preachers often say to you. I've heard preachers say this, and I know they're well-meaning, but they'll say this. You know what? If you just would, would not go to McDonald's for one week or one month, you could afford to do this for God. You live in America, pal. You can go to McDonald's and still afford it. Don't you kid me. That's the truth. You don't have to change your lifestyle. I'm telling you, you got the money to buy the tracks. If you really cared, you would go out there and buy the tracks and just leave them on the, on the doors. If you got to, if you're that scared on the last time, on that sixth time, get you a hired gun. Yeah, man, get a soul winner and just take him with you and say, he wants to tell you about what I've been doing here the last six months. <laughs> but people, wouldn't that be something you could do? Wouldn't that be something you could do rather than sit around doing nothing, practicing, like I said, for the remote Olympics, doing absolutely nothing for God? Hey, if we've only got six months, wouldn't it be nice to cover an entire neighborhood and, and just finish up and get some people saved and have them leave on the first bus out? So you can, uh, you can go through a neighborhood. 
<clears throat> and you can pass uh, gospel tracts. Uh, you can put out scripture signs in New York. Malcolm Dickman is the guy that started that, uh, that scripture. Uh, I, I've seen some of the signs, the, the, uh, uh, the bumper stickers on your cars and your uh, trunks and your doors and your uh, windshields, <clears throat> your side windows in the top and stuck to the hubcaps. Uh, I've noticed some of the uh, bumper stickers. Anyway, you know, he, uh, he had a simple idea. Everybody sees a, you know, you, we've all seen a for sale sign in the yard. So he made scripture signs that size. He just put those in the yard. And he's not a fool. He may have one side that says repent or perish, and the other side will talk about the love of God. He's not there just to rip somebody's throat out. Now, now I want to ask you a question, people, and think about this. You think this book has power? All right, just use your brain, would you? There are people who are never going to come in your, in your church. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. There are people that are never going to darken the door of this church. You know what that means? They're never going to get any scripture inside them. And if you put a scripture sign in your yard, they may be sitting there on their way to work one morning, four cars back from the light, and they're reading that, and you have no idea what the Word of God is going to do to somebody when it goes in their, head, in their heart uh, through their eye. He said, my word will not return unto me void. So people, what we've got to do is find a way to get it in them. Now, <clears throat> that's not exactly what he made those scripture signs for. He didn't put them there just so that you could slap one in your yard. But what, he, what, he, what you do is you get a route. And I know the first thing you're thinking is, uh, well, I'll, I'll do that and I'll get everybody in my church to let me have it. No, 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 man. I mean, guys at work. Let me tell you about this guy. This guy and his wife, they were an impressive couple. Uh, this guy worked all his life in Bethlehem Steel in, in western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. And if, you, if you're familiar with, uh, with the western Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio, where I'm from, I was, raised, uh, I was raised three blocks from five steel mills. This is all steel country. And this guy, he put in, um, oh, about uh, 25, 30, 40 years in Bethlehem Steel. And you know what guys do when they retire? Fall apart. They go drown worms. Or they try to have the most dandelion-free yard in the neighborhood. That's the truth. You know what this guy said? He said, I don't want to waste my last, the last years of my life doing nothing. So he got him a scripture sign route. And what you do is you put these signs in somebody's yard, and then every month you change the signs. Now, you only need one new sign, you understand? Because you put the new sign at the first one, take that one, put it the next one, next one, next one. And he said, he said, you go around, and you know what this guy, you know how he put his signs out? He'd go down the street and knock on a door. You say, what if there's a lost Roman Catholic? He didn't care. He'd knock on the door when they came and say, I'm putting these scripture signs out. Would you mind if I put one of these in your yard? You would be amazed how many people would say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Go right ahead. In the western Pennsylvania town where he was from, I remember going down a street and seeing nine of them on the same street. And there wasn't all church members. When I talked to this guy, when I met this guy, him and his wife had this 1974 Cadillac. I mean, this thing has got a trunk where we could all fit in it. <laughs> and he walked over and opened it. When he opened it, you had to stand back. It would go boom. The trunk was just chock full of scripture signs and frames. That guy had a route with over 400 people on him. You know what you don't know and you can't know? You cannot know the effect that somebody driving down the street. What do you think of some lost guy driving down the street? I'm going to kill that woman this time. And he goes by the first sign. And three houses down, he goes past another one. The four houses down, he goes by another one. He pulls up to the house and says, Honey, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. <laughs> People, we cannot know. Look, the scripture has a power over people. And it is a force for good. And not just about salvation, but if we put it out there, you have no idea the salt that will be to the wickedness in your community. And you know what he said? <clears throat> Malcolm Dickman did not have these big plans. He said, I'm just going to put these scripture signs out. And he started doing it. Talked to a few people. They started doing it. I said, how many do you have out? 
He said, Brother Sam, I quit counting when I hit 17 countries and over 25,000 signs. You ever been to boonies? I bet you got boonies here, don't you? I'm talking about get out there where, where you're so far out into town, you know, that, that you got to go toward town to go hunting. <laughs> well, we ain't got boonies like Philippines got boonies. A few years ago, I was, um, I was preaching in Tarlac, Tarlac. That's Tarlac City, Tarlac Province, like New York, New York in this country. There's Tarlac, Tarlac. And, um, and I'm, I'm riding with this guy in this little jeepney thing at midnight on a country road in the mountains of the Philippines. That's the boonies. And along the road, every now and then, you'd see this little hovel of an abode where a Filipino family lived. And it's midnight, and we're driving down the road, and his headlights illuminate one of Malcolm Dickman's scripture signs. What a blessing. And a half a mile down the road, another one was there, and this guy had put Christmas lights around the frame. <laughs> you have no idea what it was. It was, it was heartwarming to, to this guy right here just to see those signs. People, you have no idea what you could do. And see, there's a, the problem is that there's no way to record the murderers the, the murders that do not happen. You understand? There's no way to record the rapes that do not take place. There's no way to record the robberies that the guy stops on the way there because he saw a scripture sign in the yard. But I am going to tell you this, and you certainly have got to know this, it can't be bad for the, for the Word of God to be visible to people. And I'm telling you, like I said, this guy just... I mean, cold turkey, you talk about a brave soul, knock on a door to somebody he never knew and said, could I put a scripture sign in your yard? And he, and he told me, he said, you would be amazed how many people want a scripture sign in their yard. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, I'll put one in a Roman Catholic yard and they're going to think they're going to heaven. They think they're going to heaven anyway. But I'll tell you what, they'll read it. Oh, he put out a new one. I wonder what it says this month. And so you could go and you could get a scripture sign route and you could put those things out and guys, you would be doing something while you tarry until he comes again. You know what you could do? Now, I'm going to lose some of you here. I'll lose it because this, this, this will touch your wallet and God forbid my burden touches my wallet. You could support missions. They said, oh, preacher, man, did you see that uh, bulletin board back there? I go to a Bible-believing church just like this one. We got a bulletin board just like that one. And I support my church. In fact, I'm probably the only evangelist you know that is not supported by his home church. I support my home church. We have a track printing ministry, and we support that church. I support, my wife and I support our church $25 a month, the track printing ministry. Yeah, 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 I know that you, you give here and you probably have a missions giving program and, <clears throat> and you support those missionaries through your church. And what I am going to say, I don't want to, to detract from anything your church does. A as members of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Canton, Ohio, my wife and I support our, church, our missionaries. We support missionaries through our, our church too. Let me tell you my problem. My problem is that I'm an evangelist. And as an evangelist, <clears throat> you know what can happen? People give you stuff. I, I have uh, I've been places, not, not, now I've got new truck, new tires, or new tires on my truck, and, and of course new tires on the bus. But I've been places where um, some guy would, I, I, I didn't say anything. He'd just walk in and go, uh, I'll look tires on your truck. You need tires. I go, well, yeah, I do. He'd say, give it to me and I'll put four tires on for you. That's a blessing. Would that be a blessing if somebody did that for you? It'd be a blessing for me. Hey, I had to put four tires in the truck. You know who paid for them? Me. That's okay. I don't mind investing in my own ministry. I bought that bus. Nobody helped us. I don't mind. I canceled my health insurance to buy the bus. You know why? Because I had another option to cancel. The missions that we support. And that's not an option. And so, and, and, and here's what an evangelist can do. You can get in there like this. Now, uh, Please pray. I hope you all pray because you know the tires on our truck are bald and 
You know, I mean, I don't want to see my wife and children killed because of bald tires because nobody in the church cared. <laughs> and then somebody says, hey, I'll buy you tires. And I go, look how God dealt with that man. God wasn't even in the room when that decision was made. That's high-powered begging. That's intimidation. That's stealing. But beyond that, still, there are, there are people who will just give you things. When you're an evangelist, they, they will try to do things for you and give them. And I, and I, I, don't, I don't promote it. Uh, God set me straight years ago. Don't promote it. Don't uh, refuse it. Don't refuse it. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He said, don't promote it. Don't, don't refuse it. But anyway, <clears throat> <clears throat> when you're an evangelist, you get in the giving mode. That's a dangerous mode to be in. Because when you get in the giving, or, or the getting mode, when you get in the getting mode, you will start trawling for money. You will start trawling for blessing. And so I, I talked to my wife uh, early on. We've been on the road for 18 years, and this was probably 18 years ago. I talked to her about it. I said, you know, we need to keep ourselves in the giving mode. So, <clears throat> so we took on a missionary. We support missions to our church, but, but my wife and I support a missionary personally. Now, I've had people say, do you do that to your local church? No. No, look here. If, I, if somebody gives me $10, what's the tithe on 10 bucks? Thank you. Somebody knew. <laughs> How are you making it, brother? <laughs> Have you not told them? <laughs> okay, okay, the tithe on $10 is $9. If they're that dumb, they deserve to pay for it. Anyway, <laughs> the tithe on, nine, on $10 is a buck. Do the other nine belong to me? Yeah. Yeah, they do. God told me he wants, he wants his dollar and the other nine are mine. Is that not right? Don't get too pious on me. Look, buying groceries, believe it or not, is not a spiritual matter here. And buying gasoline is not a spiritual matter. And buying clothes is not a spiritual matter. And so I got nine bucks, it's mine. Now, I don't have to buy my gasoline through my church. So we support a missionary. And you know what happened? We were in a meeting and another missionary was there and God kind of laid him on our hearts and we took on another missionary. Now we support two missionaries. And <clears throat> we were someplace and we heard about this missionary and we took him on. We supported three missionaries. And then we got all the way up to four. And when we got up to four, I ran in to a real obstacle. Think of a mountain of rotten hamburger. That's my heart. And when we got to four missionaries, we were at a meeting one time. And, and the Lord dealt with my wife and I both about this one missionary to support him. And can I say this, ladies, because sometimes when a, when a man wants to do something for the Lord with money, the wife thinks about new wallpaper and tries to stop him. My wife's never been that way. And, my, and Kathy said, she knew this, that the Lord touched her heart about this fifth guy. And she said, are we going to start supporting him? Now, you understand, guys, I don't have a regular check. I don't have a regular check. I mean... Whatever you give this week, it, it, all I get this week is what you give and what I steal from the folks next door. That's it. <clears throat> and here's what I told my wife, and this sounded so businesslike and so efficient. I said, Kathy, we can't afford it right now. As soon as we can afford it, we're going to take on our fifth missionary. That stopped our mission giving dead in its tracks. Four, but no more. We were someplace, and boy, the Lord dealt with our hearts about another missionary. I mean, this guy just stood out, and, and my wife said, uh, what do you think of that guy? I said, boy, that's a good missionary. She said, I'll export him. I said, boy, I would too. She said, well, what do you think? And I said, oh, well, we can't afford it yet. And then we were someplace else, another missionary came along, and man, God impressed us both with him. And my wife, bless her wonderful heart. She said, do you like that missionary? I said, yes. Do you like his ministry? I said, I sure do. And by the way, by the way, I'm not trawling for support, okay? Because, again, I don't appreciate evangelists that, that preach about giving and end up being the recipient of their preaching, so, so I'm not trying to get you to give me money. 
Well, I don't want 50 pounds of potatoes. <clears throat> and, and my wife, I can still remember, I was, I was working on a computer. She came back to, to, to the room where I was working on a computer. She said, what do you think of that preacher? I said, I think that's a good missionary. And she said, boy, it'd be nice to support somebody like that. I said, I can still remember, I said, I said, Gipper, write him the check. And she was completely innocent. There was no goading in what she said. She said, oh, can we afford it now? In other words, I just said take on our fifth missionary. She said, and I told her and told her and told her we're not going to take the fifth one until we can afford it. And she said, oh, can we afford it now? And I said, no. But I said, I know now that if we, if we wait until we can afford it, we ain't never taken on that fifth missionary. Now, here's what's remarkable. I can remember that battle for that fifth missionary. And when we took on our sixth missionary, we never had that battle. And when we got our seventh missionary and our eighth missionary, there was no problem at all. And we got up to our ninth missionary, and then we came up to that tenth one. And you'd think, okay, man, I mean, it's going to be two times five. No, there was no battle whatsoever with the tenth missionary. When we took on our eleventh missionary and our twelfth missionary, there was no, no problem at all. And when the Lord pressed us about our thirteenth missionary, we just took him on. And our fourteenth missionary, there was no problem. <clears throat> when, we, uh, uh, when, when we were at a meeting and this fifteenth uh, missionary stood out, we just took him on and supported him. When we got up to our 16th missionary, there was no battle whatsoever. I mean, that battle was fought back on number 5. That's why it was not fought on number 17 or number 18. We got up to number 19, you know, and <clears throat> we just put him on. We got up to our 20th missionary. I'm talking about not the ones our church supports. I'm talking about that we send a check to every month. We got to our 20th missionary. There was no hesitation Whatsoever. We didn't wait for our income to go up. We didn't wait for any money to come in. We just took on our 20th missionary. And then we got our 21st missionary. And then we took on our 22nd missionary. And then I had a decision. It was after we got our 22nd missionary that we, that we bought this bus. And I told my wife, before we bought this bus, I said, after we buy that bus, we're going to be tight financially. We are tight financially. And I said, we are going to be tight financially. And I said, it's going to get real easy to say we can't afford to get any new missionaries. So I told her before we ever bought it, I said, whenever we buy a bus, as soon as we get this, this thing taken care of, we are going to take on another missionary simply so that we stay in the giving mode. And so we took on a 23rd missionary. And <clears throat> we have three large bills per month. We have our bus payment. We have, um, gee, I'm trying to think what they are, our missions, oh, and our health insurance. And they're all about the same amount. And it was after we got that bus that something had to go. Well, we got the bus to keep, so I could be here with you guys. Okay? So that was, uh, you know, we couldn't do, do away with that. And honest, guys, getting rid of the missionaries wasn't even an option. So we chucked health insurance. And believe me, when I chuck health insurance, you know what I'm doing. And we got another plan, and it's a, I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but it's, it's just saving us mission money. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, man, I can never support 23 missionaries every month. You couldn't afford $23 a month. Oh, no, no. <clears throat> the least we support a missionary for is $20. The most we support is $50. We support 23 missionaries. Guys, you could support missionaries. I mean, personally. You have no idea how good it feels to support somebody personally. See, I'll tell you exactly how I look at missionaries. I look at them as an investment. And there are some guys, guys, that I want to invest in. I mean, I want to really put something in. You know, I, I get so tired of these people that they drop their nickel in the mission offering and they think they're going to take part of some guy's mission uh, work that's uh, out there sweating bullets half a world away. And I hope when, when the judgment seat of Christ comes, the Lord takes that diamond-studded crown for that missionary, and I hope he pulls out a pocket knife. When you say, I want my part, I hope he picks out the smallest fraction of a gem there and say, yeah, there's, there's your nickel's worth. <laughs> now look, I'm going to tell some of you, you didn't know this happened. I'm going to tell something, I'm going to tell what, what happened to some of you, and you didn't know it happened. 
but you're going to go back and realize it did. You ever been in a service, maybe here, and there's a missionary preaching? And when that missionary got done preaching, you thought, man, our church needs to support that guy. I don't know how to tell you guys this, but if God wants this church to support somebody, he ain't telling you. He would tell him. And you came over to the pastor and said, Pastor, well, we need to support that guy. And your preacher said, no, I don't think so. And you walked away going, he's just not right with God. He's not spiritual. <laughs> Maybe God didn't want the church to support that guy. Maybe God wanted you to. You know what happened? God laid that missionary on your heart, and you thought about 20 or 25 bucks a month, and you thought, ouch, that hurts. I know. I'll get the church to take care of it. Then I can just throw my nickel in and I can still have part of the ministry. People, I'm telling you, you can support missionary. Now, <clears throat> here's the nice thing about this. Ha, ha, don't say amen to this. But did, the, did your church ever not take on a missionary that you wanted to? Or took on one that you didn't want to? We got 23 missionaries. We took on, we wanted every one of them. We want every one of them. And you know something? We passed by some guys we didn't want. <laughs> My money. I can do what I want. You know what you could do with your own personal mission support? You could support somebody in every one of the continents. You could have somebody in South America. You could have somebody in North America. You could have somebody in Australia. You could have somebody in Europe. You could have somebody in Asia. I doubt, and I'm not going to say it as a joke, I doubt you can get anybody in Antarctica. But you could have somebody, you could have, you personally could have a worldwide mission program. Our mission giving is larger than some churches. We support more missionaries than some churches do. You know what you could do? You could aim one at your ethnic background. I'm not big on ethnic background. I'm not big on being an Italian American and a, well, nobody would want to be a French anything. <coughs> <clears throat> my background is Romanian, both sides. My grandparents came over here from Romania. My dad and mom were, were first generation. I'm actually a second generation American. We don't go back to the Mayflower. All those black folks that are mad at white folks for owning slaves wasn't us. <laughs> we got here late, bucko. We're from Romania. We support a missionary in Romania. But wait a minute. We're actually from the portion of Romania that is now known as Moldova. I'm glad you're sitting down for this. You know where we're from in Moldova? Transylvania. <laughs> That's the truth. You ought to see me on a full moon. I finally have hair on a full moon now. Just that I have it everywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> we support a missionary. To Transylvania, or to, uh, to uh, Moldova. My name ain't Gip. The Romanian name is G-H-I-B-U, Gibu. That's how they said it over there. Well, you know how neat it'd be to get up to heaven and find somebody named Gibu that got saved because I supported a missionary in my country. Are, are you from, are you, your kin folks from Italy? Your kin folks from Germany? Where, where is, hey, you could support as many missionaries to that country as you want. I have never looked into my roots. I couldn't care less if I'm a distant uh, uh, heir to the throne of Romania. You know, I couldn't care. I'm not proud. I'm not looking for my family shield to be hung on my uh, den wall. But, but it is nice to have somebody over there who just may run into one of my distant cousins and lead him to Christ on my buck. You could support missions. You could support them worldwide. You could support them to one country. You know what you could do? Now, a bunch of you are gonna, you're going to opt out for plan B. You could write them. That's cheaper than support. Oh, yeah, you could write them. You have no idea what a blessing it is to a missionary to get a letter from this country, even if they don't know the person that's writing to them. Man, you could write to them. You could send them gifts. You could write to somebody and just, hey, there's somebody back here on that, on that mission board, and, and maybe you've got a burden for that country. Or, or you realize the burden that they're going through 
And you could write that person just say, man, I appreciate I just want to let you know that there's somebody over in Minneapolis that is just uh, appreciative of what you're doing, uh, and I'm going to pray for you. I mean, you could support missionaries. Or you could... You know what else you could do? Ladies, this would be a good one for you. And now is the time. You could have neighborhood Bible clubs. Man, you could have every Saturday for the summer, you could have Bible clubs in your backyard. Let me tell you what happened. This, this thing impressed me. I'm, I've never been a big bus ministry person. And you know where I went to school, where your pastor went to school, the buses were kind of frowned on, or oh yeah, they're trying to bus them in to count them up and all this stuff. But let me tell you what changed my thoughts on buses. I was at a church one time, and <clears throat> this church had, uh, I don't know how many buses they had. But one night, they're going to have all of their bus kids get up and sing. And I can still remember the figure. They had 104 kids. And these kids looked like bus kids. I mean, dirty T-shirt, runny nose, whole nine yards, unkept, unbathed. And these 104 kids got up there, you know, and, you know, and I mean, their parents probably weren't out there and didn't care as long as they were somebody taking care of them. And these kids, you know the, you know the songs they sang? The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. And, and they sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And here's what came to me as I watched these little kids. Fifty years ago, in this country, kids learned those songs in their living room on their mother's knee. Some of those kids went to sleep to Jesus loves me, this I know. Fifty years ago, kids were learning those songs on their mother's knee you know what happened to some of those kids? Those kids grew up, turned 18, got out of church. They left home. They got away from God. And after they found out that there's nothing really out there to chase, and they were at the end of their rope, and they said, man, nobody cares about me. A little song that their mother had taught them came back to their mind. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they came back to church. Some of you are here now. And as I listen to these bus kids, you know what I thought? That's 50 years ago. They're not learning it at home anymore. Moms are not teaching their kids the B-I-B-L-E and Jesus loves me. And I thought as I looked at those 104 bus kids, I thought, you know something? They're learning them here now. And some of those kids right there are going to grow up and turn 18 and get out of the house and out of church and away from God. And they're going to be off in some room someplace just about to pull the trigger because they're going to say, nobody cares about me, and a song's going to come back. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so that they learn because somebody took them to church. And they're going to get back in church. Ladies, make them chocolate chip cookies. Give them helium-filled balloons. Let them bob for apples. Let them have a nice, clean party in your backyard. And include a Bible story. Your kids in your neighborhood desperately need to be taught the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. They desperately need to hear Jesus loves me, this I know. Because you know what's happening now? We're walking out and talking to teenagers and they don't even know who this Jesus guy is. That's their term. I don't know who. The, I talked to a guy, he talked to an 18-year-old girl who didn't even understand what sin was. Ladies, you have no idea, guys, no, no idea. Bring them in. Let them have fun. Let them have fun that they don't have to regret. Let them have fun that they can come and go and leave clean. Let them have fun where they actually know, I think this lady cares about me. I think that guy really cares about me. And they taught me this song. People... You could have neighborhood Bible clubs. You could do that while you tarry until he comes again. You know what you could do? Now, you could think, I'm crazy on this, but this is a good one. Well, it may be passing. I call it the tracks in a phone booth ministry. Now, I say it may be passing because with the advent of more cell phones, phone booths are becoming harder to find. But, but you know there's any number of places you could leave tracks. I mean, on a regular basis. You know what we do? <clears throat> this, is what my, this is what my wife and family and I have always done for a good time. We would be on the road, and, and you know, we've always been pulling a trailer. And, so we'd have the trailer to, to, to uh, 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 stay in. But sometimes, usually on a Friday night, we'd be on a road, 
Instead of getting a campground, we'd get a motel room and order a pizza and have it delivered to the room. Be still my heart. <laughs> now, you know what I do every time I go to a motel room? Every time. I go preach someplace, and I'm not going to order a pizza, but you know what I do? I go to the Yellow Pages. I go to pizza, which is always right after pages and pages of physicians. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> but some of the pizzas I've had, I am, I, I, I think I know. I hate to look through the Yellow Pages. So I put a track on the pizza page. You know why? Because I'm not special. I'm a typical American. And I know that somebody else likes to go to a motel and order pizza. And I'm being nice by putting a marker there so they can just open it up. Honest. I'm, I'm being nice so they can open up and there's the pizza page. But I also know they're going to get that track. So I, I, put, I put a track in the pizza page of, the motel, of every motel I stay in. You know, you could, uh, you guys go, go to work and you go past the phone booth and you can walk up there and just put a, you can put a, a track in a phone booth and you have no idea where, where it's going to go. I, I carry these tracks. <clears throat> and you know what's nice about those tracks? They're about the size of a pack of matches. You ever seen a guy that smokes? You know, a lot of times, I don't know if they still do it, but you buy a pack of cigarettes in a machine and a pack of matches will come down. And I've seen guys walk in and sweep their hand through a cigarette machine just looking for matches. Man, I'd love to go to a cigarette machine. Throw that in there. And some guy go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's got it now. He's got it now. You could go by, look, you could go by the same phone booth on a weekly basis and leave gospel tracks. And somebody would be getting them. You know what you could do? You could just go through a parking lot and put tracks in the track delivery slot on a car. You know what the track delivery slot on a car is? Sure you do. You've all seen it. Here's what happens. A lot of times, somebody will be getting out of their car and they want a gospel track and there's nobody there to give it to them. So they say, well, I'll leave my window down this much so that somebody can put one in there for me while I'm going. You didn't know that's why they did you, What did you think? They're just trying to let the heat out of the car? Would it be something to get to heaven? You're talking to this guy and say, how'd you get saved? He said, you know, you're not going to believe this. But I was driving through Minneapolis one time, and I, I pulled off the road going to this uh, gas station, and I left my window down that much. And when I came back, there was this pamphlet on the driver's seat. Now, I was going to tear it up and throw it away, but you know, I got to reading it, and I trusted Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. And you say, were you driving a blue Taurus? I heard of a guy that used to put tracks in a bottle and throw them in the Mississippi River. You say, what happened to him? We don't know. Let me tell you about gospel tracks. I got to tell you this. The first gospel track that I passed was the standard gray and pink Simple Plan of Salvation track. We've all seen it. I was saved. <clears throat> I gave it to a kid that was uh, right down the street. His name was Louis Brio. Louis Brio's a Roman Catholic. I saw Louis about a week later, and he said, he said, Sam, he said, you know that little pamphlet you gave me? I said, yeah. He said, uh, if I read that in my room, and when I got to that prayer, if I got down on my knees and I prayed that prayer and I meant it, am I saved? I said, Lou, if that's what you did, yeah, you are. He said, well, that's what I did. That was the first gospel track I, I have passed. I didn't see Louis for 14 more years. I remembered that testimony when I saw him, but I wasn't going to remind him of it, okay? And so I asked him this question, I just, like he had, like I'd never witnessed to him, I said, Lou, I said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you go to heaven? He said, yeah. I said, well, why? He said, well, Sam, you're not going to remember this. But he said, when you first got started on this, he said, you gave me a little gray and pink, and he gave me that same testimony 14 years later, almost word perfect. You know what? Louis Brio got saved. I told you I'd tell you this. I went down to Pensacola. <clears throat> there was a man preaching, and one of the things he preached, I, people, I have no idea why this man said this. I have no I, I don't believe it's a biblical conviction. I don't know why he said it, but I did it. Here's what he said. He said, I think all Christians should have their own personal supply of gospel tracts, not always rely on what the church offers free. 
I don't know why he thought that. All churches are just like this one. They've all got a track rack back there where you can grab them and, and walk out. And some of you are still sitting here with no gospel tracks on. You walk past free tracks walking in. You walk, walk past free tracks walking out. And every one of you, watch this. How many of you have ever been in a situation and you went, man, I wish I had a gospel track and didn't have one? Come on, come on. Okay, whose fault was that? Oh, t- somebody stole them. <laughs> yeah, and I'll bet the dog ate your homework. When that guy got done preaching, I went back to the church track rack in Pensacola, Brent Baptist Church. I picked up a track, looked at the address, wrote to that place, got a box of tracks. For 34 years, I've always had my own supply track. This particular track, <clears throat> we carry it for two reasons. One, um, it really doesn't do us any, we- any good to, to get tracks from the last church and pass them at the next one. I'd be passing tracks from Gaylord, Michigan here. And I'd be passing, if I grabbed yours, I'd be passing tracks here in Rockford, Illinois. And Rockford, Illinois, I'd be passing Rockford, Illinois tracks in Chicago. And I'd be passing Chicago tracks in Erie, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and so I have this one. And, and it even has our address. I had a guy say the first gospel track I passed. I don't know how many tracks I've passed over the years because I'm, I'm not one of those people that keeps count. But I've passed gospel tracks for 34 years. I have never gotten the second testimony of anybody getting saved. I have never heard of I, I, I talk to guys, and, and I've had pastors get up, and they'll, say, they'll sit there and say, yeah, this guy got saved, and he sent it into the address on the back. Guys, it's there. It's there. Send me something. <laughs> I have never had, in 34 years of passing gospel tracts, I've never had a second testimony of somebody getting saved. You say, Mike, if you think nobody else has gotten saved, I don't believe that at all. No, no, that's not what I said. I said I haven't received the testimony. I could take you back to March of 1973 in front of my sermon book and tell you what, pre- what sermon I preached on, at Zion Hill Baptist Church in McNeil, Mississippi. In the front of my sermon book, I have got 162 pages, 44 lines per page. I've got everything I preached, every place I preached it for the last 30 years, 31 years. But I can't tell you where these went. You know what I'm looking forward to when I get on the other side? I I look forward to finding out about a whole nother life I had. I'm going to find out what happened to all them tracks. I got a feeling that's going to be exciting. You know what I'm not? I'm not a farmer. I told you, man, I'm raised to st- I'm not a country guy. Cathead biscuits and black eyed gravy and that junk don't mean nothing to me. I like the sound of the foundry. I really do. I'm not a, I'm not a gardener. I'm not a farmer. Tell me something. If for 34 years I put a, I put a, a bag of, of seed corn over my shoulder and all I did every place I went was just through corn in every field. Wouldn't some of it take root? I mean, it'd never be those perfect rows that are 12 feet tall that you'd see the combine chewing up. But if, have you ever looked at a bean field and saw a rogue stalk of corn? <laughs> I was there. That's me. And when I get on the other side, guys, I'm going to find out what took root. And I feel so sorry for you. I am looking at so many empty shirt pockets, guys. In a church that I believe loves the Lord and a church that cares about people. And there is no telling what you could do. You could go back there. You could take those tracks. You could buy some of the chick tracks. Or you could, buy, you could order your own tracks. You could be doing something while you tarry till he comes again. I'll tell you this. There was a lady in a church, and unfortunately, you know that there's always spiteful people in churches. And there was a lady in church, and she's just one of those bubbly, spiritual, sweet ladies that you can only take for about five minutes. Well, I, you know what I mean, you know. I mean, that nothing gets them down. I mean, if a train fell on them, they'd go, wasn't that nice? At least it didn't happen to you. I'm so glad it happened to me and not you. 
There was a lady like that, man, she would, she was always passing gospel tracts and always candy for the kids and, and passing gospel tracts and knocking on doors. I mean, and, and there were just a few people in that church that just, just, that just grounded them. You know what happened to that lady? This happened. She had a stroke. Why she had a stroke and some of the deadheads didn't, I don't know. But she had a stroke. And she ended up confined to her bed in her bedroom, in her house, never to knock on another door, never to give another gospel track. And one of those good, godly, green-eyed sisters from the church came by to visit her, sat by her bed, and coyly said, uh, my dear, it's just so bad, you know, I, it must really just bother you terrible that you can't get out like you used to. It's just so sad that, you know, I just, just must just really eat you up that you can't go out and knock on doors and pass tracks like you used to. You know what this lady said? She, she didn't pick up it. She said, uh, give me the phone book. She handed her the phone book. There was a marker in G. She said, you're right. I can't pass tracks and I can't knock on doors. So I said, Jesus, what could I do for you? And she said, you know what? He said, you could just call the phone book. <laughs> she said, I've got all the time in the world and they're all local calls. And she said, I started at A. She said, I'm in G. You know what? She just didn't want to do this. Couldn't she do this? Couldn't she really be excused for doing this? Not for her. Not for her. She wanted to do something. You know what the Lord told you? He said, I'll come again. You know what you ought to tell him? I will tarry until thou come again. You know what I'm telling you tonight? I am telling you, why don't you find something you can do for the Lord while you tarry? Rather than twiddle your thumbs, rather than sit around on the end of your couch watching, watching NFL reruns, why don't you find something you do? Why don't you do this? If nothing I've said flips your switch, why don't you go to your God tonight and say, Lord, I'm open. Show me what you want me to do. I haven't told you anything tonight that's confrontational. If you say I'm not good with people, I haven't told you anything that if you're afraid of people that should be, your, be a problem to you. I have nearly cussed in the pulpit because I did tell you that you may have to buy gospel tracts and spend some of your money. But what, hey, you know what? If I was confront, if I was afraid to confront, uh, con and you know how I hate to be confrontational. <clears throat> <laughs> but if I was, if I couldn't talk to people well, man, money would be an easy way out. Support and missionary would be, be a great way to get around that. Leaving tracks where there are no humans would be a wonderful way of doing it. <laughs> That's right. Hey, you know what I did? You're going to think I'm, you're gonna think I'm crazy. I'm going to find out someday if I'm crazy. When I was in Bible college, I was building houses. You know what I'd do? I was a painter. I'd go in the bathroom. I'd take the toilet paper holder. You know the little spring-loaded thing? I'd take it apart. It was clear plastic. It wasn't clear. It was translucent. And I'd roll up a gospel track and I'd stick it in there and I'd put it together. He said, whatever came of that? I have no idea. I don't even like to think what somebody was doing when they found it. But there's anything, there's any number of things you can do, people. You can do something while you tarry until he comes again. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed.